Dr. Buttram, good to see you again here on good, Health Connection. Good title to see you of too. our segment is Allergy Myths, Nothing to Sneeze At. Excellent. Clever, right? Yes. We hear, so let's get started. Let's go down the list of these. We hear people say that if you didn't have allergies as a child, you never will. Truth or myth? Uh, myth. The, the frank truth of the matter is most allergies appear in childhood. However, you don't have to be a child to be allergic. You don't have to be a child to become allergic. So later in life, the frequency of new allergies is less, but they do show up. What about the claim that if you live in a high pollen area long enough, like East Texas, your body will build up antibodies naturally? Is that true? And your allergies will eventually go away? Fortunately for me, no. If that were true, I wouldn't be in business. So if you live in an, aller an allergy filled area, um, you will continue to have symptoms, unfortunately. Now, as we get older, and there's a, a terminology called senescency or kind of lowering of the immune system. Over time, as you get older, usually allergies become less of a problem, but that's usually in your sixth, seventh, eighth decade. I have had patients, on the other hand, who continue to develop new allergies even into their 70s and 80s, so that's not a given. Okay, let's talk about food allergies. When you hear someone say that you can outgrow food allergies, is it true, and if you can, what are some examples? Most of the time you do outgrow food allergies, so the majority of food allergies appear in children, um, and most of them will outgrow them, certainly by puberty, um, to the tune of about 85 to 90 percent. There are some allergies that do tend to be lifelong. Um, the most common are shellfish, fish, and peanuts. So if you develop those allergies in childhood, usually you keep those throughout your adult life as well. Okay. Many people believe that if you eat the local honey, it will help you alleviate your allergy symptoms, kind of like a allergy shot by mouth, right. fact or myth? Uh, myth, unfortunately, um, that's not the case. There, there are some uh, kind of theoretical benefits to that because you would think, well, you know, bees make honey, they collect pollen, that pollen then gets in the honey and so by eating it, it's almost like getting allergy shots. Unfortunately, the pollen that bees collect is what we call entomophilus pollen, which are um, pollens that are distributed by insects whereas the pollens that you're allergic to are anemophilous pollens. Those are pollens that are distributed by the winds. So there really isn't a whole lot of pollen in bee and honey that you would actually be allergic to. The other problem with that is, even if there were, it wouldn't be at a steady enough dose to induce tolerance over time. And then kind of the third thing that's um, concerning about bee pollen, or excuse me, um, honey, is that it can contain bee proteins such as pieces of their shells or venoms and those things you can be sensitive to and you could theoretically have uh, systemic reactions with those bee proteins that are in the honey. Okay. Gluten-free products exploding on grocery store shelves. Fact or myth? People can be allergic to gluten. Gluten allergy is probably a terminology that is um, distasteful to most allergists, um, no pun intended, because there's really no such thing as gluten allergy. You can be allergic to wheat, so you can have IgE antibodies to wheat that cause characteristic symptoms of anaphylaxis, the uh, life-threatening type of allergic reactions, or severe atopic dermatitis, allergic skin disease. Um, it's even been implicated in something called eosinophilic esophagitis. But gluten sensitivity is a different type of immunologic process by which you've made IgA antibodies and it causes celiac disease or gluten enteropathy where you have primarily GI symptoms. Or you can have dermatitis herpetiformis due to gluten, which is a specific type of skin reaction that you have. So gluten allergy doesn't really exist. It's either wheat allergy or gluten sensitivity, which are those things like gluten intolerance or celiac disease or dermatitis herpetiformis. Okay. You're allergic to eggs, so you can never get the flu shot. True or false? False. We used to think that was true. So long ago, if you had a true egg allergy, we would say never get the flu shot. Um, over the last probably five years, that's been proven to be false. Most people who have even severe allergies to egg can tolerate the flu shot. What we do as a precautionary measure, and a lot of people know, is there are low um, egg type vaccines that have very small amounts of protein compared to the original vaccines 
or there's even um, a flu vaccine that has no egg in it. But even for those people who truly have egg allergies, they can tolerate even the normal vaccine. We usually do that under observation though. Okay. Let's talk about pet allergies. I've heard people say that if you're allergic to dogs, just get a short-haired dog and everything will be okay. Is that true or not? I wish it were. If that were true, I would be breeding dogs and selling them out of my office. <laughs> um, however, um, unfortunately, if you're allergic to dogs, all dogs produce dog dander, and it's all very similar. There are people who can tolerate being around different breeds, but that's not really anything that can be um, forecasted at all. So I can't tell you that, oh, you'll do fine around this breed or that breed. It's more so by trial and error. Um, on the other hand, if you're allergic to dogs, I'm going to tell you probably to get a dog is a bad idea um, because you, if you're already sensitized, the likelihood that you're going to have symptoms is actually pretty high. Okay. You may have answered this question. Are there really hypoallergenic dogs, dogs that you're just not going to be allergic to? And if they are, if, there's, if that's true, what are those dogs? Not really. Some people will say that shorter haired dogs ought to be better because they um, you may have less dander in circulation if they have shorter hair and they have less shedding. Um, there are also um, individuals who will say, well, if your dog is easier to potty train, certainly proteins in the urine can be problematic. Or if you have a dog that doesn't slobber a lot, um, the uh, proteins in the saliva can be problematic too. But unfortunately, again, there's no way to forecast which dogs will do well for you. You may be more sensitive to some breeds than others but there's really no way to tell which ones are going to be which for the individual person. What about cats? Oh, cats are, I won't say cats are evil, um, but cats are a little different animal, so to speak, um, compared to dogs. A lot of people will show sensitivity to dogs on skin testing or laboratory testing and have very little in the way of clinical sensitivity. That's rarely true for cats. Um, if you're sensitized to cats, you're usually going to have problems with most cats. Now certainly it may be possible, and I've had some patients who say I do fine with these cats but not with others, but that's much more rare as compared to dogs. Okay. All right, so what about the reverse claim? What about the claim that we're growing up around animals will help prevent allergies, true or false? There's actually some truth to that. Um, there's something called the hygiene hypothesis. I don't know if you've been familiar with that at all, but um, if you compare children who grow up in situations with more animals versus less. The children with more animals usually have less tendency toward allergy, um, whereas the children who grow up in kind of cleaner, more sterile environments usually have more allergy. The, the basic tenet of that hypothesis, and there's, it's been borne out in several different types of studies, is that early on, if you have more uh, exposures to different types of infections, it kind of turns your immune response away from allergy and more toward the usual way we respond to infections. Does that argue that your immune system needs something to do? Yes, it actually probably does. Um, and the other um, portion of that discussion about the hygiene hypothesis the, is the um, microbiome of the gut. So the more different types of bacteria you have in your gut, it actually leads your immune system or seemingly does in one way or another, either away from allergy toward other responses, or certainly there have been other associations with other disease processes that may be impacted by that as well. Okay. What about individuals who say, I'm allergic to everything? That's you know obviously a stretch, but are there cases where people are allergic to an unusual number of things? Uh, certainly in atopic or allergic individuals, they may be sensitive to several different types of things. Um, most often, you're going to have probably one area that seems to be your worst. So for instance, if you're allergic to inhalants like trees, grasses, and weeds, it's not unusual to be multi-sensitized to several different types of inhalants. Trees, grasses, weeds, cats, dogs, dust mites, cockroach, molds, and the like. Um, certainly there are people who are allergic to inhalants, they may be allergic to foods, although with food allergies usually it's not multiple foods, it may be one, um, maybe two, but certainly not a lot more than that in most individuals. 
Um, there are a lot of people who feel as though they're allergic to everything, um, but there are a lot of things that are irritants that will cause similar symptoms to allergies that can be confused um, with that process. And so, for instance, with food allergy, there are a number of foods that either contain histamine or cause histamine release, and those individuals can have what we call histamine intolerance, where they have very similar symptoms to food allergies, but they're not truly allergic to those foods. It's more like they're getting a dose of histamine when they eat them, and they're very sensitive to those, those types of things. When you talk about inhalant allergies, there are a lot of um, irritants to the nose and to the airways, and so people will say, I feel like I'm allergic to scents or odors or cleaning agents. Those things aren't really allergic triggers, they're irritant triggers that cause very similar symptoms to allergies. Okay. Well, here's the last one. Here's the last true or false. My allergies, my allergies are not serious enough for allergy, allergy shots or drops. True or false? False. Certainly if you have allergies, um, depending on the severity of the symptoms, um, you may be more likely to seek out further treatment with, with immunotherapy. Um, what I've often encountered is patients who have been told, oh, you just have allergies. I certainly wouldn't agree with that statement because certainly allergies can be very severe. Um, they can impact your ability to function at work, your ability to function at school, your ability to function at home. And so if you have severe enough allergies that it's impacting your daily life, then certainly they're severe enough to consider really aggressive treatment with things like immunotherapy. Very well. Very interesting. Oh, thanks. Doctor, thanks for being here. Certainly. Thank you for having me.